Jeff Schaefer is a longtime filmmaker whose credits include everything from Seinfeld to creating the very popular fantasy football show on FX, The League, to being Larry David's writing partner and a guy who directs a number of episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm. He is essentially to Curb Your Enthusiasm what Larry David was to Seinfeld. That's right, the Larry David of Curb Your Enthusiasm, if that makes sense. Now he's nice enough to join me for a few minutes to talk about the final season of Curb and more. Jeff, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm great. Um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you again. It's been a little bit. It has been a little bit, and uh, we've got a lot to catch up on, including your Seahawks. I know you are a Michigan Wolverines fan, so we have to uh, give congrats to that national championship. But we do need to start with the elephant in the room, and that is Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, the final season kicked off. Last night on HBO, season one, or uh, episode one, excuse me, in the books, you just told me before I hit record, though, that you guys actually have a couple more days of filming to do? Yeah, so last week, last Tuesday night, we had the premiere, and it was amazing. It was great. Uh, that next morning, bright and early, we went to New York, so Larry could have cost a Muppet, and we did a lot of press, got back last night, and you know we spent the whole four or five days talking about how this is the end of Curb. There will never be any more Curb. Curb is over. Done with Curb. Um, tomorrow and Wednesday, we're shooting two more days of Curb. What are you shooting? We're shooting. So because of the actress, there was two. There were some scenes we wanted to do because of the actor strike. We weren't able to get to them. And then actor availability sort of pushed us to this date, um, which is after we've premiered. So. Um, it's for episodes later in the season, but we're going to shoot for two days tomorrow and Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then race, even though we haven't done anything for a long time, race to get them into the show. Um, it's so dumb, but we want to shoot it. and It'll be fun. I'm sure it will be. And if nothing else, uh, Curb having a final season is worth it to watch Larry have to answer the same questions over and over again and just how more and more annoyed he gets with each interview and each question that he is being forced to provide a response to. It's the same question. I literally watched him on the red carpet. He was, he had done question after question of the same stuff. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? You know, why are you ending? Why are you ending? And he went to the next guy and he goes, ask me a question you've never asked me before. And the guy stopped and he thought for a second. And then he said, how do you feel about the ending of Curb? <laughs> And Larry, Larry lost it. He just lost it. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, everyone's, ex everyone is, I think, dubious <laughs> that this is the end. And rightfully so. We, every season's been the end. So I get why they don't trust us. Um, I totally get it. But um, this one, this one feels like the end. Well, I would assume that the way that you shot the show and whatever the finale holds, it signifies a sort of end. And of course, you can always erase that if you want to. I heard Larry on Bill Simmons podcast a couple of days ago and he talked about I think it was after the, at the end of season four or five, like he had planned on that being the end of the series. Oh, no. Is, Hold on. The, the final episode of season five was literally called The End, and it was yep. not an ironic title. <laughs> he was done. Done. And then, you know, he goes out in the world and people are terrible and things happen and he wants to say something about it and he comes back. But for this season and this, the way we, the way the story led us, um, it's the, the funniest version of this season is if it's the finale of the series. Hmm. That's why, all I can say. Why is that? You see, now you're asking follow-up questions <laughs> because you're a good journalist. But I can't tell you anything or Larry will literally appear on this podcast and like rip my head off. Um, <laughs> he wants, he doesn't like any spoilers. He doesn't even like those next week ons. Yeah. He wants, you know how like you go to bed, your, your face looks normal. You go to bed, you wake up and you've got like a big pimple. That's how Larry wants the show to just show up. He just wants the show to just be a big pimple on the forehead of the TV landscape and everyone has to deal with it. <laughs> That's so well put there. Okay, asking a general question then, because you guys both had a hand in the Seinfeld finale. You've obviously done finales for other shows too. And I don't know if 
the last episode of the most recent season of Dave will turn out to be that series finale. But holy cow, you want to talk about an incredible episode of television. Go back and watch that. Watch the whole series. Watch that, too. We may get to that in just a second. Did you guys talk at all about just how to go about dealing with that final episode, considering some of the unfair criticism with the Seinfeld finale, which I thought, as somebody who was a big fan of the show beginning to end, was a fantastic way to end that show. Did, was there a lot of conversation that uh, that you guys had with regards to how you wanted to do that? Having ended shows before, show endings are really hard because it's a breakup, yeah. right? You have a relationship. The audience has a relationship. With this, there's a 20-year relationship with a show. It's some For some people, it's the longest relationship they've ever had. Um, and all of a sudden, we're leaving you. So it's always like, tense a little bit and but i think what we've realized is the best version of a finale is a really good episode of that show it's not a different beast it should feel like a great episode of curb your enthusiasm and and i and the one that we've done does that and it's it's a really funny episode of curb and that's what we were aiming for prior to this season do you have a favorite curb episode I really love, love, loved, and some of it just for personal reasons, the final episode of season seven, which was the Seinfeld reunion. Mm -hmm. Just having worked on Seinfeld and getting to go back to the set, um, it was like this seven layer dip of like meta comedy and memories and, and, a, and a class reunion. So that one I think is, my, is one of my favorites, but it was weird. I mean, look, you're on the Seinfeld set again. Larry's back on the Seinfeld set. My writing partner, Alec Berg and I are there and we're watching a scene from Seinfeld and there's the cameras that are quote unquote shooting that Seinfeld thing. And then behind that are our curb cameras watching Larry watch the thing. So the scene, the Seinfeld scene ends and Larry goes up to give notes to the actors. And in my head, I'm back in the nineties and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to give some notes. I've got a note too. And Alec literally grabs my belt and goes, you're going to ruin the shot. <laughs> That's we're still in the show. I'm like, Oh, right. Oh my God. So, right. So anyway, that one, just for like getting to see everybody again. And it's so funny. I'm, and that's the way to do a reunion, by the way. You're doing a reunion, not for money and not for like, because everyone's bored or because it's like, you're doing a reunion for a really funny comedy reason. So that was the Seinfeld reunion. Well, it was the perfect way to do the reunion for that show too, because you have two of the greatest sitcoms of all time. And there's that meta element to it. And even though you don't see the, reunion episode itself from beginning to end. I feel like between table reads and rehearsals and some of the sh scenes that were actually shot, you did get the entire 30 minute episode or whatever it turned out to be. That was so complicated because over the final two shows, like we had a decent, no showing which part of the Seinfeld reunion show are we going to show in the table read? What are we going to show behind, you know, as background? And, and what are we going to show on air? It was, it was really tricky, but I think we, we pulled it off. So this has been a big news week for you, Jeff, because not only is uh, the final season of Curb starting to air, but I think it was last week that it was announced that Dave is going on hiatus. Will it be a season four? We don't know. Well, all we do know right now is that uh, Dave, a.k.a. Little Dicky, wants to go do some other things. And so the show may not be coming back. Um, is that something that you guys were aware of as you were working your way through season three, is that there is a possibility that this might be it for this excellent series? Every season, in between seasons, Dave's tried to do music because that was his, it's his first job. It's his first love. He hasn't put out an album in a long, long time. And he would, but it was just impossible. It, the, the show is, the show takes up too much of your time. Um, by the time you're done editing, you better start writing again if you want to be on any sort of cycle. And so I think, you know, it's been seven years since he put out an, he put out an album of the show music, but his own mu music, he's been working on an album for like seven years and he just couldn't finish. He's like, I've got to, I want to finish this thing. It's killing me. And it's like, great. I think, so we'll see. It's like, I'm really proud of the show. I think if, if we never do another episode, the final episode of season three with Brad Pitt um, is about as good a way to go as you're ever going to find. So, um, but we'll see. I mean, Everybody still loves it. It's just a question of he's got other things to do. And I respect that. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to not be doing both at the same time, which I was for the last two seasons, yeah. which was brutal. 
Well, look, there are a lot of Curb and Seinfeld and even some League episodes that are in this category. That final episode of season three of Dave, it may be a top three to five episode of television that I've ever seen. That was brilliant. Did you realize in the moment? I'm not sure. I know that you have a writing credit on that show. I'm not sure if you did any directing for that final well, episode. I don't, I don't but, have a writing credit or director. I was, just, I was there. Okay. But like, it started with Dave saying, I really would need Brad Pitt. And everyone saying, okay, well, you're not going to get him. So what's our plan B? And he wrote a beautiful email to Brad. And Brad responded, yes. And I was like, what? So again, never doubt, never doubt little Dickie. So then it was, Brad was excited to do it. Um, the Then it was, who's going to tell him he's got two all-nighters? We shot, and I got to say, Brad was the coolest. He stayed all night, two nights. When it wasn't his coverage, he stayed and read with the other actors. He was amazing. I mean, couldn't have been a sweeter, cooler guy. Couldn't have spent more time. Like, was there the whole time, was with the team the entire time. So when you're getting that much Brad Pitt, we had like four solid days with Brad. You're like, but, and and you're watching. He's like, he's so great. You're like, I knew you knew it was going to be special just because one, it's like this, this, you know, all star of all all stars just joined the team. Um, but two, he was so good that we felt really good about the episode. Once he was there, it's like, oh, this is going to be great. So wait a second. Those hostage scenes were really shot over that night. Was that done intentionally to have everybody a little bit disheveled and lacking sleep? The problem is if you want to shoot night. You know, we need it's that house was all glass windows. Mm. Um, and so if you want it to look like and, and not look good, you got to shoot it at night. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. He, um, yeah. Those were some crazy all nighters, especially one of them. I had, was a Friday. I had just finished shooting. Cur so I'd shoot curve from seven to like seven and then go to Dave all night <laughs> like on a Friday. Then you're like. You wake up Saturday morning, you're driving home and the sun's coming. You're like, that was a 24 hour work day. That's, that's not healthy. That is crazy. And uh, good for you for, I guess, getting it done because the, uh, the finished product turned out to be well worth it. All right. We need to talk a little football now, Jeff, because yes, yes. Uh, one of your college teams, I know you're a Texas fan too, although Texas was pretty good this year as well. Mm -hmm. uh, your college team is doing really well right now. Whereas your NFL team uh, it was a uh, bumpy season, to say the least. Are you still a Seahawks season ticket holder? Oh, yeah. Still a huge fan. I mean, look, for the Seahawks this year, it was a real sliding doors season for the Seahawks. And it could, I can give it. I can give that sliding door one event. You're play, Seahawks are playing at the Rams. They're winning by, like, 10 points. Aaron Donald smashes into Geno Smith's elbow. Geno Smith is now out for the entire fourth quarter. Drew Locke comes in. We end up giving up some touchdowns. Gino bravely comes back and we miss a field goal. We make that. You're looking at a 10 and seven season. You're looking at the number six seed and you're might be looking at another year of for Pete Carroll yeah. playing out his contract, but it didn't happen. Nine and eight doesn't make the playoffs and you know, big changes, big changes happened. Um, but it's amazing how, I mean, Aaron Donald, it's just crazy. I mean, he, he knocks out Ross. He knocks out Gino. It's like this guy, he's so good. I'm actually very excited. I mean, I'm sad that Pete's gone because I loved him and he was the Seahawks. He created that culture. Um, and I loved what he did Monday through Saturday in getting the best out of the players and make, and, um, but you got to look at the stats, you know, you got to look at a 21st overall offense. You've got to look at 30th in the league on defense, 31st in run defense. And you got to say there are too many good players on this team, too many individual great players on this team for the record and for these rankings. New schemes have to come in. And I'm so excited about Mike McDonald. I think he's amazing. I think he's done amazing work in a short amount of time. He fixed the Michigan defense the first year they went to the the college football playoffs. He did that. And he is, he's Jesse Minter, who's also awesome, is just working off of what Mike McDonald established, this pro-style defense, disguising blitzes. I mean, when you look at the Ravens, sorry to go on about this, but please do. Know, when you look at the Ravens, last year they were 26th in blitz rate and number one in sacks. 
Oh, I didn't realize the blitz rate was that low. I knew the sack number and the turnover number. Those obviously really help uh, you win football games. Past two seasons, 23rd and 25th in pressures. But they've converted 42. Last year, they converted 42% of those into sacks. You know what that says? That says people are getting free shots. And you know why they're getting free shots? Because the defense is being disguised and people are confused and you're getting free runs. And that scheme, that scheme over that scheme that's creating individual stats and and these amazing, these amazing defensive stats. And so I'm so excited to see what McDonald can do with our players. You know, Chenna's coming back. Got to re-sign Leonard Williams. He was amazing. Jaron Reed's there for another year. Mafe's coming around. But, like, you know, what can we do with this scheme? What can we do by disguising our by disguising our defenses a little more? If we can get half of that, I know we don't have Roquan Smith, but we got Michael Brooks. Got to re-sign him. But, like, anyway, I'm very excited for this guy who everyone seems to think is the smartest coach on the planet. And we need it because look at our division. McVay, like, used to just yawn and stretch and and – beat us with like these crossers over the middle, the space between the linebackers and the safety just, all, I mean, it was just like, the, it was just like him doing yard work. <laughs> it's like, all right, there's the Seahawks defense. We got it. And then you've got Shanahan. So, and we need to be, to be com- com- competitive in this division. We need to beat the Rams. We need to beat the 49ers we need to be competitive with them. And look what Mike McDonald did to the 49ers on Christmas. Right. Blew them up. Yeah. Blew them up. So it's not apples to apples. We don't have, you know, that Kyle Hamilton, Roquan Smith, whatever, but we do have good players. So I'm really excited. Do you think we see a continuation of the Geno Smith era in Seattle or is it time to secure the bag with Drew Locke? This is just me. I have no idea what's going to happen. The question, there's also, a, there's a third option, which is, do you take someone with the 16th overall pick? And, but they're not mutually exclusive. You could say, Drew, we're sorry, you're a free agent, you're going. Gino, you do one more year. We take a quarterback with the 16th pick and then groom him for a year. Is that Penix? Is that McCarthy? I don't know. Is that, do you move up a little bit and try to get Jane? I don't know. I, and, but they don't have a second rounder. So, or do you get that first round pick and really shore up your interior offensive line or you get an edge rusher? It's, it's tricky. I personally would keep Gino one more year. Um, I think we have the, and I'm sorry for all you Texas fans. This is like hearing about someone else's dream. This is like talking about the Seahawks. <laughs> but, you know, if they can get Tyler back on a re- reduced deal, because he's he's his deal's too much, but DK, JSN, um, you know, two good running backs and a decent tight end and a decent offensive line. These we have the tools. I actually like the idea of drafting Penix. I was at that game in New Orleans where he was just throw, throwing darts all over the field on that Texas secondary. Granted, the Texas secondary wasn't great for a lot of the night. If you can let him sit out for the year and heal his body up, because the big thing with him is injury risk. If you can let him heal up, take some time off, learn that offense, because he's a really sharp dude too, obviously. I have a feeling that if he can avoid that catastrophic injury, he is going to become a special player at the next level. So you might have the game plan to help make that work versus forcing him into action too early and take a lot of uh, a lot of unnecessary shots as rookie season. It's not expensive in the grand scheme of quarterbacks to keep Gino, sign Gino for that next year at 27 or something like that and have a rookie quarterback for a for rookie first round quarterback. That costs nothing. That's that's middle of the pack quarterback pay. Um, and then you've you've got your, you know, you're hoping you get your Alex Smith um, to, uh, to Patrick Mahomes, you're hoping you can have that baton pass. I mean, Penix got Penix got turned into a human pinata in the in the college football championship by the Michigan defense. Just that was so. Here's the thing about so I go to the Rose Bowl. Mm-hmm. To see, I'm a huge Michigan fan, born in Ann Arbor. Uh, went to the Rose Bowl, saw that game, so happy, so excited. I'm mean, there with some friends. We're like, we're going to the national championship. Mm-hmm. Great, got a. Uh, hotel, uh, airport hotel that my friends from, uh, DC got tickets, really good tickets, really expensive. But when's Michigan going to go to the national championship again? I'm going to splurge. Why not? Um, I fly out Monday morning games, Monday night, six 30 in Houston. Uh, my plane's a little delayed, but I still land. I've got like a four hour buffer. Um, we're flying into Houston. It was the roughest flight I've ever been on. It's one of those things you like, 
you start wondering how an airplane really works. Like <laughs> what, what in here is floating? Like, how is this going to happen? And all of a sudden we just start going up, up, up. And I go, oh no, we're not going to Houston. And we get diverted to Corpus Christi where we sit on the tarmac with all these other things. I'm watching the clock and thank God my plane had those, you know, those little TVs on the back of your seat. Yeah. So I'm sitting on a tarmac in Corpus Christi. I watch the game, the entire game that way while my seats on the 50 yard line were just sitting there. We finally took off, landed in Houston. And there's another big Michigan fan across me. He's like, let's just try and go. Let's just try and go because it's the fourth quarter. So we run through the airport, drop our stuff, pay a cab like to drive 100 miles an hour in this rainstorm. I got to NRG Stadium as the game ended. We talked through seven layers of cops to let us in. I got to my seat, tapped my friend on the shoulder, said, what I miss? And then I got to watch the <laughs> and I got to watch the ceremony, at least live. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I am in pain for you, man. That sucks. But if you had told me at the beginning, if you told me in September, hey, Michigan's going to be playing in the national championship and they're going to win and you're going to have very expensive tickets, but you're not going to get to see it, but they're going to win. I would have signed that piece of paper so many times, every time. That's I'm still happy. Well, especially with everybody knowing that Harbaugh was going to be gone after this season. And I'm not going to say it was now or never because they still have a really good roster. They have to reload it a bunch of positions, especially on offense, but this is the time for them to make that happen. And sure enough, it paid off. Now, Texas plays at Michigan in week two of the 2024 season. I'm going to be heading up there for that game, and a bunch of other Longhorn fans are as well. For you as somebody who is an Ann Arbor native, is there a thing or two that people need to make sure to do other than tailgating go going to the game itself that makes for the complete Ann Arbor slash Michigan experience? And there's Zingerman's. I mean, you're going to have you're going to have a blast. I think so. I'm not as up on. I want to ask you because I should ask you. Texas does didn't lose as many people. I know they're losing those two, those interior tackles, right? On yeah. defense. They're yeah, because uh, yeah, Byron Murphy is in a mock draft that came out today was predicted to go to the Seattle Seahawks, as a matter of fact. So yeah, the right. interior tackles in all of our wide receivers, our top five uh receivers, including the running back, Jonathan Brooks, Jatavian Sanders, and our top three receivers. But Sark has done a great job of reloading in the transfer portal on top of guys who are already on the roster, too. So getting Quinn Ewers back is huge. They have four of five linemen back, and the two running backs who were really good once Brooks went out with that knee injury are also back to go along with a bunch of guys on defense. And, of course, getting to keep your coordinators on each side of the ball. And Sark, of course, takes care of plays on offense. But keeping Pete Kwiatkowski on the defensive side of the ball helps to neutralize any individuals that may be lost on that side of the ball as well. So Texas should actually be pretty good next year. Michigan is losing a lot, a lot of players. I have, I have some friends, you know, in uh, NFL scouting and, you know, they have each college has a, a list of players, you know, that they should be looking at when they go to the college. They said the Michigan one was like, like 28 people long. Um, you know, some of them are, a few of them are staying now, but a lot of them are seniors and a lot of them are going. Um, it's going to be very, it's going to be very interesting. I think you're going to catch them. You're going to catch a very young team very early. So uh, I think you're going to end up being, no matter where you go in Ann Arbor, I think you're going to end up having a good time. <laughs> I think you're going to be very happy. Yeah, much like Texas fans who went to that Alabama game in Tuscaloosa this last year. You caught Alabama at the right time, and you made it work out and really well. And that was uh, one of the biggest reasons why you got into the college football playoff at the end of the season. I heard yep. Larry mention with Simmons that if he could change one thing about football, he would completely remove the goalposts. Have you had this conversation with him before? That is insane. I have, I have a conversation with Larry about this like two or three times a season. <laughs> so, in fact, okay, so just for, for our audience, so Larry does not want any more field goals. He does not want any more extra points. He feels like it is a non-football play akin to, like, playing the whole game and then deciding the winner by having a juggling competition or a pie-eating contest. He doesn't, <laughs> it's, he doesn't want it to be a part of football. And his point is, how exciting would it be if you know you can't kick a field goal, right? Well, then you're just the Detroit Lions. <laughs> but, yeah. but anyway, so, and his idea for the extra point is that you get the ball on the one and you it's a one point if you make it from the one put the ball on the two like it is right now it's a two-point conversion put the ball on the five 
and it's a three point conversion. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to fly, but I do, I have, huh, I was recently, uh, I was talking with him and he was asking me who, who owns the UFL, the new spring league. I got to talk to them. And so we looked around it turns out the rock, yeah. the rock is, you know, pretty much the owner. He's like, I got to talk to the rock. So I'm sitting with him and I didn't think he was going to do it. I didn't think he was going to even get the numbers. I'm not, but like, I'm sitting with him when we're chatting and his phone rings and all of a sudden he goes, it's the rock. And he, Larry pitched his little heart out to the rock. I want, I, I want you to hear this thinking <laughs> this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> like think of all the press you're going to get. He pitched his little heart out on, on trying this at the UFL in two months that they would just eliminate this. And I go, how'd it go? And he goes, no, you seem really interested. He said, oh, that's really interesting. And I'm like, oh my God, what I'd pay to be on the rock side where he just puts his phone down and go, I just got the weirdest call from Larry David. <laughs> so everyone watch out, look at that spring league and let's see, let's see. If, the, if you see them tearing down the field goals, the field goal posts, you'll know that Larry won over, won over the rock. Look, that would be a brilliant move by the UFL because they can say the Larry David effect on football. I mean, that yeah. right there will get more people to tune in. Yeah, so we'll see. And I I tried to let him down easy by saying, well, look, the first season's right here and right away. So, But they can change. It's just the UFL. So maybe they'll change it for the second season. He's like, no, no, I think they're really considering. He really thinks they're considering it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love yeah, it. So that's what's happening. <laughs> that's what's happening over here. Madness. What a world, what a world. So I'm glad that in the first episode of the final season, you guys are starting to tackle the whole dogs in public thing because that is one of my biggest pet peeves over the last couple of years is dogs being allowed everywhere. I understand you love your dog. We're all dog people. Larry loves dogs too, but there is a line that is being crossed now. So I'm glad Curb is tackling that. I've got a couple of other ideas. If there is ever a 13th season of Curb, for you guys. One is the person who wears entirely too much perfume to the point that it literally chokes yes. you out. Cause I had to leave a movie the other day because the person sitting next to me was so perfumed up. And then also the, um, Oh gosh, yeah, they're walking around in a cloud. It's a cloud. It's a cloud of perfume. It's terrible. Oh, the other thing. And I know Larry has fun with parking and also, uh, with handicapped people. I saw somebody the other day with a handicap placard, who parked in the spot next to the handicap spot, which is essentially the closest spot for a right. an primo spot, best spot ever, best spot ever. But I saw somebody with the placard park in that spot versus the two or three open handicap spots. And it's like, hold on a second. You have your reserved seating here. You have your reserved parking here. This is for the people that don't have that placard to feel like a king for a day. And you just ruin somebody's dream. In this case, it was my dream. Right, because they're parking. What they're doing is they're parking in that primo spot, and then they're using the handicap stuff as like a porch. Pretty right? much, they've got, yeah. They just they've got the whole thing now. Right, that's a, a handicap pig parker and a, basically a parking hoarder. So interesting, like it. So what's next for you now that uh, Dave is going to be on hiatus for at least a little bit? Curb is done after these next couple of days of shooting. What's next for Jeff Schaefer? Well, you know, when we're done shooting, we still have to edit it all. We have to fit it into the show and then we've got to mix it and then we've got to color it. So my next, my next month um, is still, is still very much in curb land. Um, and then playing around with some, playing around with some new stuff uh, that, uh, and you know, my office, Larry's right next door and we're still talking about the, you know, petty injustices that the world heaps upon us. So, so we'll see, you know, I don't think, I don't think he's done having, you know, spirited conversations with the populace of the West side of Los Angeles. Mm, beautiful. Cannot wait to see what that, become, what becomes of that. And final thing, Jeff, what does curb your enthusiasm mean to you? Curb means comedy, not a, not a comedy that's not funny. That's trying to make you cry, but an actual comedy, a comedy that's trying to make you laugh. And I think, um, you know, we're not much on like, legacy or whatever but i do know that for a long long time people are going to say oh my god i just had a larry david moment you know that should have been in curb oh my god that just happened to me that should have been in, it was a curb moment like and i think that's um that's i think you know how we're going to be remembered as this 
hopefully this very funny show that people are still like living in their own lives, even if we're not on the air. I had a friend the other day, he called me, he said, I had another Larry David moment. I'm like, what is it? He's like, I went to a urologist. He wanted to feel my testicles. I'm like, if you feel something, are we going to have to do testing? He's like, yes. And he's like, all right, well, can we just do the testing then? I don't necessarily want you feeling down there. And the doctor's like, can well, I, I still need to feel I just skip the middleman? Exactly. Skip the middleman. Skip, skip the uh, getting the, the middleman is like two of your fingers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, he is Jeff Schaefer. Uh, Jeff, can uh, people, uh, you mind showing the people the uh, Sacco real quick? Oh, well, this is what's, okay, well, hold on. So for the league that the league was based on, we have a, we have a Shiva and a Sacco, and the Sacco was destroyed, even though I have these nice big carries. So right now, all I have is, all I have is the top of the Sacco. This is the guy who won the Sacco. Oh, Rob's going to kill me. And this is, this is what I have to bring to the, this is what I have to bring to the trophy store um to remake the sacco it's got a lot of different parts to it it's very complicated um the guy's gonna lose his mind but it must be done because we must have a sacco what place did you get this year um i ugh, fourth fourth just mediocre Lost mediocre the semis. yeah i just i didn't have it i did not have it um my team was you know what it was lamar jackson was a was an amazing quarterback this year. I mean, MVP worthy quarterback. But for fantasy, he was just all over the place, and I just he didn't do it for me. Um, but hope springs eternal next year. Next year, yes, it does. Uh, Thank you so much for the time today. People can tune in every Sunday on HBO. New episodes of Curb all the way to the end. It's been yeah. a real pleasure, man. Hopefully, it is not as long in between times we get to talk. So fun, Trey. I'll see you soon. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. More of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. Talk to you next time on Books on Pod.